Hello, professional property managers. Welcome to the Triple Win Property Management Podcast. My name is Laura Mack, and I am your co-host. Um, today, we have a great episode for you. Our Triple Win events are typically recorded live on Zoom in front of an audience. And for this episode, we had our biggest turnout to date, where a couple hundred PMs plus some joined us live to talk about AI in property management. So really excited for you to listen to this episode. We dive in deep. So in the beginning, you might feel a little out of your depth, but just hang in there. We very quickly get to some practical applications that you can apply today in your property management company. And we actually got some feedback that we needed more. So you guys wanted more, we delivered. We got on a follow-up call with Wolfgang Krosky, who's one of our panelists and spoke to him for about an hour on practical applications of AI and property management. So that is being uh, recorded and uh, produced as a follow-up podcast episode that will be released on March the 9th. So be sure to look out for that one. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Andrew Smallwood, Ray Heston, Tom McGarry, and Wolfgang Krosky. Enjoy. My name is Andrew Smallwood uh, with Second Nature, and we've got Laura Mack here, who is co-host of Triple Win Live, where we say uh, there are no rules, the points don't matter, something like that. Uh, we, we don't actually have a tagline, but uh, we just like to get property managers together, talk about topics that are interesting here, create some value for each other, um, put in a little effort to organize, bring some expert panelists in, uh, and just create as much valuable uh, content and connection and collaboration as we can. Uh, for you guys. We'll have a couple exciting announcements at the end of the call about upcoming events and opportunities for you to continue to participate and keep the conversation going. But we are here today to talk about AI in property management, AI in action, and very excited to introduce uh, our expert panel that we have here. Um, so with that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring up Tom McGarry to the Zoom stage first, Laura, Second Nature's CTO. And Tom, if you wouldn't mind just sharing with folks who sure. haven't had a chance to meet you and a little bit about yourself. Great to meet everybody. My name is Tom McGarry. Like Andrew said, I'm Chief Technology Officer at Second Nature. I've been doing big software for 30 years, company building for 20 years, uh, big software engineering, started in a desktop, moved over to big web applications, um, enterprise at one point as well. So done a lot, built a lot, done a lot. And um and recently, in the past 10 years, really data has been sort of my, my mantra. And uh, what I realized through the years is that uh, uh, we built big systems, but we never took care of the data. Data came as an afterthought. And uh, data strategy came in much later. And it was always a disaster. And it was also always very difficult to implement after the, after the fact. So I've been on the soapbox to, to make sure you have a data strategy. I've been involved in data much more in the engineering side and the plumbing side, bridge building side. But just recently... I've uh, obviously taken an interest in, in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, uh, and really in an academic sense uh, in, in, for the time being. But I'm very, very excited about bringing it into bringing uh, the, uh, data science into into our own um, ecosystem and leveraging it where we can to mostly do at, at this point predictive modeling. Really see where we instead of just react reactionary uh, historical data mining. Really to see where we look forward. Uh, try to predict things before we see them, and uh, and and you know try to hit the market before you know before things really move. So really, really excited. I hope to share some technical aspects of uh, not too technical, hopefully, but uh, you know shed some light on some things that you know that uh, that aren't completely apparent. So uh, I'm excited to be part of this, and uh, thank you very much. Awesome. All right, Tom. Thanks for that. And uh, coming in from Charleston, South Carolina area as well. I know we've got a couple yep. folks on here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, with, with Paul Meadows, probably some, somewhere nearby. So right next up is uh, Ray Hespin, CEO, founder of Property Meld, co-founder of Property Meld, and, uh, and Winston Churchill with him as well, I think. So there's Ray. Ray, for those who don't know you, uh, would you mind giving a little introduction about who you are, who Property Meld is? 
So I'm going to go and uh, baseline uh, set expectations right here. I'm the least qualified panelist in the room. So, um, so just everything that comes out of my mouth is probably going to sound a little bit less intelligent than the peers that are on this panel, but super thrilled to be part of this. Um, as a lot of you guys know, I uh, co-founded a software company called Property Meld. We specialize in maintenance coordination. My background, oddly, um, I, I, I'm a degreed mining engineer, not super relevant <laughs> to real estate, but the thing that I've always done is I've worked in operations prior to coming in this business. And so I've learned the superpower of what automation and data can do in decision-making and lean margin businesses. So I'd like to think that we've taken some of that, <clears throat> moved that over into maintenance. And uh, the thing that I love, much like Tom, I'm a huge data fiend um, in this business and I recognize the power that it brings. So a lot of you guys probably see on LinkedIn, I tend to surface a lot of property mail data. So I'm super excited to talk about AI, the mechanism that ultimately gets to use some of this information um, today. So thanks for having me on, Andrew. Yeah. And, and Ray, I think uh, for probably the benefit of mental health, amongst other things, I don't think you're on Facebook the way you used to be anymore, but Ray is a great follow on LinkedIn. I'd highly recommend everybody on this call go find Ray. I love following him on LinkedIn and a lot of the insights he regularly shares from the unique data set that Property Meld has. So I just encourage folks to go do that. Okay. Uh, hey, that, that means we've got Wolfgang himself. Bring him up to the <laughs> stage, please. Wolfgang Krosky, there he is. All right. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Wolfgang Krosky, our family has a real estate company in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, honestly, I'm probably the, the least qualified in here when it comes to this tech and everything. So I'm really going to be your translator. I'm going to turn AI to toilets. That's kind of the goal today and how we can use AI for... Uh, dealing with those things that we have in property management and in real estate, but uh, really excited to be part of this, not only to share, but to learn and uh, to look at how we can use AI much greater than just asking chat GPT some stupid questions and seeing what it, it spits out. But uh, for me, why I have a passion for the automation and AI and tech is we're a small independent company and you see these large franchises and these VC backed behemoths, and nothing against that model. It's just for me, technology is the great equalizer and it allows us to compete with these nationwide companies and to provide not only the same level of service, but to be able to pivot and adapt much quicker than those larger companies can. So for me, if you're a smaller company, uh, AI, automation, tech is, is that equalizer that's gonna allow you to shine just as well as these larger companies. Awesome, all right. Well, hey, that gives you a little bit of introduction. With that said, we're going to get this kicked off. And, you know, Tom, I'll come to you. But I was telling these guys, my goal here is to throw some questions out and just let these guys chat for a little bit. Um, you know, but I think a good place to start with all, all three of you is, you know, context around what frameworks or definitions do you feel like are important so that we can all kind of have a similar understanding, you know, here when, when I... Here AI, I feel like uh, for me, you know, it's it's meant a lot of different things or a lot of things have been called AI. And so something I've always wanted is a little more clarity on, you know, how, my, how we might be defining that in this conversation, uh, you know, where that can go. I know Wolf was saying not just chat GPT, right? It's uh, other things here. So things like AI, machine learning, you know, or what's training inference or, you know, what are these different key terms we may need to help us through the conversation? So Tom, I'll let you get us kicked off here and then we'll go to Ray and Wolf. Yes, sir. so real quick, Ray, I'm a classically trained aerospace engineer and material scientist. So we've got to figure out, get together and see what went wrong there. Um, but let's start with some basics, right? So uh, just to get some definitions out. So try to separate these, the, 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 the learning world into two different aspects. So there's machine learning, right? And then there's what's called artificial intelligence. Let's put that to the side. So machine learning, um, let me just, I'm gonna try to keep it simple. Statistics on steroids. A lot of this is stuff that a lot of you've taken stats courses, even the simplest stats courses you would be familiar with. So I'll, I won't, I'll spare you the details of what supervised versus unsupervised is, for example, and all the buzzwords. But if you think about it, machine learning is using uh, processes, statistical methods, to deal with large amount, amounts of data. And there's basically two, let's say two things you can really do with this. Uh, one of you, one is you probably all heard of regression, linear regression. You have a bunch of data, it's on a graph. 
you plot a line through it, and then you figure out what, you know, if you have another input, you have that particular that pathway of that of that line, you can figure out where that target variable is going to be. And then you have other uh, other machine learning models where you can cluster, you can cluster data, you can take large amounts of data and start to find patterns, right? That's more of the unsupervised versus regression, the supervised. So the point is machine learning, just think about is 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 really advanced statistical methods with uh, with high computing power and uh, having to deal with lots of high volumes of data. So put that to the side. And then you have a new concept that was introduced you know, maybe 50 years ago, but now it's obviously come to the forefront, which is you know, this learning model, deep learning, they call it. A lot of buzzwords are artificial intelligence, and it's a little bit different. So there's no predefined um, algorithms or statistical processes, right? It's it's actually when you break it down, artificial intelligence to its to its bare minimum, it's pretty simple, right? You have you have these an individual they're called neurons, right? And uh, it, formally they're called perceptrons. Like I don't want to get too into the, to the weeds, but they're very very simple logistical little points in in, in this structure. And what you do is is like I said, I don't want to get into the weeds, but each one of these nodes has a very simple a very simple uh, job. It's either to it's to take a piece of data that's coming in, and then figure out whether how close it's going to get to an output in the next at the next node. Now let's let's just keep it at that, right? So the whole point is that you need to, is the artificial uh, a neural network concept just to to put billions of these together and pump gigantic training data sets through it. And then you have the training data set, what's important to note is you have this data and then you know what it's gonna be, that's why it's training. So you know the output of, of what, what that data should be. And then what you do, and I'll spare, I'll spare the details of the gore details of how this works through the network, but by assembling billions of these, of these nodes, um, you can pass data through and then using statistical methods inside each one of those nodes, you can approximate at each one of those points some sort of accuracy. So. In, in the end, what, what's happening is the, the, the model in itself is very simplistic. There's no actual algorithm. Um, there's just a set of points with, with uh, a certain weight factors across the entire uh, neural network that you, you, would you establish this, this massive set of parameters that becomes your model. And you store your model, and then you, obviously you adjust these parameters and tune these parameters to get as close to accuracy in that training data set as you possibly can. And once you have that, you have your model ready to go. And then you can run data through it and see if you can approximate and find out what target you, you, targets you want. Now that's very technical. I apologize to get so much in the weeds, but the point I want to get to get at a higher level is that in, in itself, our artificial network is composed of very actually not very intelligent things, but assembling massive amounts of these. You, and you can tune it. You can tune a very gigantic set of data to to get uh, results that you that you expect from a training data set. So. I'll leave it at that. I just wanted to throw that out as the basics and start there. I'll, uh, we can go eventually into what different models there are in each one of those, but that's how that's in the basic form. Those two components are what are the building blocks of of, of learning of machine assisted and then artificial learning. So. Um, I think that was great. I see people appreciating the chat. I also know there's some folks like me that just heard Perceptron for the first time. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that that's really appreciate very that. Old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, Ray and Wolf, what would you add here of like how you guys think about a framework or key definitions that we, we should have here before we get started? I think I should have brought Coke for this meeting because like, <laughs> so I think I'll break it down for a fifth grader. Um, basically, you just take a whole bunch of crap and language and stuff put it in the computer and the computer tells you how accurate it is and spits out assumptions. And um, yeah, I mean, I, to me, that's what it is. It just takes mm -hmm. all kinds of information and it tries to act human-like and it tries to act upon that. Um, what's interesting though, is those that have been kind of following this AI, have, there's been things surfacing, oh, AI's got bias. And people said, no, it doesn't have bias. It just depends on all the information that was thrown in there. So if you only throw in certain bits of information, did you create the bias or does the AI have bias? And um, to me, that's interesting because for, I'm seeing questions come up about, well, how is AI going to help property managers? I think the number one place we're going to see this real quick is tenant screening and coming up with why or why not you should rent to a tenant, which is probably going to make those fair housing ambulance chasing attorneys just their minds are going to be blown because, well, the computer did it. It wasn't me. There's no bias. 
So uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how it does that. But I think if I were to explain AI, actually, I, I asked Chat GPT right now what a what was it a Perceptron? Um, it's like a Marvel movie. But basically, the thing that for me that was interesting was recognizing patterns in data, making predictions, and processing large amounts of data, and adjusting the algorithms just constantly. You know, that's the learning part. So I think it's just that those large data sets and having a company like Second Nature and Property Meld on here who have, I'm going to say they're large data sets. I know it's not like Google and it's new. What they come with some crazy names, not Brad. It's like Bard or something is their competitor. Mm -hmm. Those are massive data sets, but you know, to, to look at it, it's basically just taking this data and making predictions off of it. I, I'll, uh, I'm going to go ahead and live out what I originally anchored here at the beginning. I think Tom has got, you know, by far, if we got into a conversation more than about 30 seconds about AI, he would school me and I'd shut down. Um, but uh, the best way that I heard somebody to describe it, and this was like the most articulate version, and I think it was so well done in doing it, where you try and figure out, it's about this large data sets that you train models on that make individual decision points that ultimately create an output that you're trying to go for. Uh, the best way that I ever heard chat GPT as anything, it was a calculator for words. It's the first one that we've had, where you basically try and you put in some information, much like you do a normal numerical calculator, but it's a calculator for words. How do I come to this output? And so the machine is sitting there in the middle, right? Your a calculator has been defined on metrics and logic and some like this. But you take something like human language that is much more complex, and you're basically creating a model between you and your input and what kind of output you're getting. I think that was the best way that I thought was described to me that a, a Neanderthal like myself could ultimately understand. But I think the big underlying thing is the data that's required to produce these things of any accuracy is like the foundation of all of it. And I know we're going to jump into that, but. Yeah, I, I think I heard all of you say the importance of the data set and the size of it, the quality, the diversity of it, right? Uh, that the, like that's going to determine what training, right? All these, uh, I don't know if neuron is the right word, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. get. And then, you know, it really, it, it seems to me like it, maybe I'll misexplain AI and you guys can either tell me this is right or, or help correct it in a way that would give people the right nuance. But, you know, I think about automation, which has been a big word in technology, right? And that's like people deciding, deciding what should happen, right? And then, you know, the technology is kind of like doing, you know, doing that. As we move into AI, it's actually starting to make proposals, suggestions, recommendations, right? And ultimately even decisions, right? And that's kind of like the distinction of what's happening here as opposed to, um, it, and I, I think Tom, you made a, a mention of like, there's supervised, unsupervised, like maybe there's more nuance than that, but that seems to be a lot of like what people key into here as the bit, uh, you know, part of the big potential of radically changing how work is done. Is that, is that fair guys, or does that need correcting? I think, I think the big thing that, and, and Andrew, this was the big thing is I was kind of like writing down notes. You know, if I'm anybody sitting in this room, I'm sitting there going like, I'm seeing this brilliance of chat GPT and I'm sitting there understanding what kind of implications of my world it's going to be. I think understanding why chat GPT exists and what information it has and like, what are some of the carryovers um, that are part of that? Now, um, if you guys all remember, I remember probably even five years ago and use the term automation, Andrew, but I remember if you really wanted to like make a splash in the industry, it was integration, API. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the other buzzwords were. And I can tell you at that same time, if you want to go pitch somebody on why they should invest in your company, it was AI ML and you had to say it in that order. Like it's just all these buzzwords that go, all right, well, what does that mean? Well, and then just start putting it into practice like APIs require work, like it's connecting points. And most people just don't understand that, right? It, a lot of people do, but it's it's endpoints and you got to connect it over here and how does it work? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, awesome. That's a big buzzword, but once people get into it, it's how does it work? I think the biggest thing that's been super interesting to kind of like explore what are the implications of this in the industry is to understand like, first of all, foundationally, like troves and troves of clean data. Um, now, chat GPT, basically, and I don't know what data it gets to train on, but it gets the entire internet, has tons of communication, and gets to see everything that's written about there. But now let's take that sort of thought process to like your business and making a leasing decision. 
Where is that data? How well is it stored? Mm -hmm. What's the cost of not making the right decision? And I think one of the big things that I'm seeing, at least in where kind of the gaps in GPT, and I'm curious on Tom's and Wolfgang's thoughts, is like, we're just starting to surface massive amounts of data. There's an exciting product coming out in June. And I'm sitting here going like, until you have this really nailed down, the application becomes so limited, or at least the accuracy in those Tom was walking through of that output being the right decision. So that way, as Wolfgang's saying, like even in a leasing conversation, if you don't have enough information built into the models, like some of these things become very risky that you could turn down a perfectly great prospective resident mm -hmm. or uh, let a, a terrible one in. And it all comes down to what is the data available to make some of the decisions in our industry and who has it? Because that's a... Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I'm oversimplifying it, but no, I just jumping in here. I want to make a couple of distinctions about, you know, the applications. Okay. So chat GPT, obviously it's really based on, it's a natural language processing, um, uh, model, right. That that's fed, you know, terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes of text of volumes of books, data, et cetera, like basically textual information. And it's really, it's, it's just a, it's sequentially, uh, modeled uh, way to take an input from a previous word and figure out what the next word should be. And it just used masses of amounts of data. So the point is that there's this application is really for, at this point in time, language. Obviously, you can figure out all the different applications you could use for that, like we're, we use now, like obviously uh, chat and content filtering and content generation and whatnot. But then there's other aspects of AI that that and machine learning where, like I said before, predictive capabilities. And I think obviously... Uh, like Wolf, uh, Wolfgang said, screening is a huge one. But then there's other applications of you, you could take data that you might that be very valuable. That's in that's leasing data. That's that's housing data, and then you can use that to make predictions across all different types. Of what are called features, and uh, you know most of us call numbers like parameters, variables, and AI word they're called features across. For example, different uh, geographic markets. You might want to spot patterns in there within different. Uh, you know, there's there's different models of of, of uh, neural networks for image recognition that we know very well. Obviously, we know that that it's used for facial recognition and image recognition and whatnot to do to to do. There's all kinds of different applications. There's the operational side of things where you could do something like chat and natural language processing. But there's also, there's also this analytical capability, which is where I want to take a lot of this in, inside uh, inside second nature and to use that to to be ahead of the market. It's, it's uh, analyze these data, analyze uh, patterns in this data. And get to get and use that to to, to better uh, and be in more intelligent, right? Uh, intelligent approach to hit the market, and uh, and I think that in just separating these contexts and uh, trying to find the applications for AI in the right context is probably where the biggest challenge is. There's a, a plentitude of models and free models and free frameworks. I didn't really want to get into the specifics of frameworks yet because that's very propeller headish. Um, of, uh, but there's plenty of different tools you can use, but applying them to the right context is where the, uh, the one of the biggest challenges is besides data curation and data and data hygiene and data quality. So I just want to throw that out there, the topic point. I'd love to throw this on its way to Wolf, which is maybe in the chat even, if there's folks on this call who have started to use tools, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. ChatGBT or um, Jasper or like there's, I know there's a number of tools for like content generation, whether it be for listings or SEO content to attract owners or, you know, I'd love to hear like, where are people using some of this now? And our panel even asked, like, they were curious about this. We'd love to, to hear that or, or see that in the chat, you know, where you might be using it now or considering using it, you know, next. And Wolf, what do you see there as far as, as you know, potential practical applications and or where it's being used now. I know you predicted screening earlier. What else are you seeing? So I was, uh, and I don't know where the speech was taken and quite honestly, now seeing what AI can do, I don't even know if he really said it. I, I don't trust anything on the internet anymore, but supposedly the gentleman in this video is the current CEO of, uh, I guess it would be either open AI or chat GPT. He's a current CEO and he says, you know, when AI was coming out, we expected AI to replace all of the like blue collar jobs and then work its way up. And that the last ones to be replaced would be the creative type jobs and professions. And what they're finding is it's the complete opposite that AI has pretty much put out of business, the creatives. 
Um, you literally using like Synthesia, there's another one called Dub Masters. You literally can create a phenomenal video all from, you know, AI. It's, it looks like a real person. They're talking, they have movements, they have tone of voice, et cetera, all, all from your, your computer. So I, I would say as far as realistic uh, applications that you can do right now and you should be doing, if you are still wasting your time trying to draft up creative property marketing descriptions, you just need to stop. Nobody reads them anyways. Like I, I'll buy you lunch if you actually leased a property because somebody says, you know what? That marketing description was phenomenal. That's why I want to lease this house. Never said anybody that. So why spend a lot of time on it? Put it into chat GPT. Say I have a four bedroom, three bath house, 745 Railroad Avenue. Give it three descriptors and tell it to keep it under 300 words and you're done. So how can you automate that? So we're a lead simple user, love it. And so I'm building a zap right now that when we click a task, it's going to take some fields and lead simple, the bedroom count, bathroom count, and a new field that where we call it three characteristics. It then goes to chat GPT. It creates this phenomenal description, brings it back as a note, and then now it can go out into the marketing. And why waste your time with the social media stuff? You can have it create a, a Instagram caption with proper hashtags and emojis and a Facebook. So if you are if you're spending Time on that, just stop. Nobody reads them anyways, but your owners require it, so it's got to be done. So the the marketing descriptions, flyers. Um, in my spare time, I uh, I run the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, and we're doing something with manufacturers, and it's called advanced manufacturing. And everybody's like, "What is that?" So put it into the AI, and it came out with next generation manufacturing. Okay, so we then asked it to define that. Then we told it to write a blog post. Then because we're saying this to kids, we asked it to do a 10 question multiple choice test. And then we asked it to translate all of that in Spanish. And then we asked it to create a radio ad. And it even told us when to put in sound effects and all these different things. So the, the creative side, really, I would use AI for that right now as a property manager. The next thing that I would use um, AI for is your your other content for blogs and things i saw a couple comments about well you know is it copyrighted who owns it all that i will tell you this out of my own experiment i put into chat gbt the same prompt 10 different times got 10 different answers somewhat similar but crafted differently from my previous life as an educator i still have access to some um plagiarism tools threw it in there and it passed every every time so it is, I would say, genuine content. Um, there are definitely similarities. Like if you ask it to draft up an email for you, it's always going to say, I hope this email finds you well. I don't know. That's a, that's the line that it likes. But if you're struggling creating, so if you're using a tool like Lead Simple or whatever that has like email templates and you know what it wants to say, but you're just not mighty at Word, put it in there, have it create the template for you. Even if you don't like it 100%, it's better than starting from scratch. So now you can build your email templates. If you have an email that comes in and you're not quite sure like how it would respond, give it a try. You can tell it, can you, how would you respond to this email, but with like an uplifting tone and it'll go from there. I, I hope uh, at one point, you know, um, you know, using uh, inbox that we can, the AI will, in, the email will come in and it will say, you know what? Normally this email should go to Carlos since they're our maintenance coordinator. But this person sounds really upset and it just automatically escalates the, the mail to me because it detected that this person was upset rather than getting lost in the back and forth. So I think that the, the, the communication and marketing piece is a place that you could start with AI right now. Uh, there are free tools and then there's some uh, paid tools, but that's where I would start today. Wolfgang, I, I think that's super interesting. And I, I think the thing the the biggest thing that I heard from over on your end was it's taking some of the things where it's not necessarily decision making in kind of an aspect. It's more like content curation that maybe somebody might outsource to a, a you know, a fiber or somewhere there and like further reducing some of the costs, maybe enhancing the speed of kind of the return. I think as we've been looking at maintenance, like in general and the application of AI, by the way, we've got a uh, an engineering manager here that was so mad that he's not on here. I said, first of all, you'd ruin the podcast because he would 
if you think propeller head was not a word, it would be a word by the time we were done. He's amazing. But you know, the, the thing that's interesting about AI is like, what is the cost of making a wrong decision? Mm. And, you know, he was a former AWS, uh, Amazon employee. And, you know, that's one of the things, even if you get it 96% right, what's the cost of getting it wrong 4% of the time? And you have to like really weigh those risks. And sometimes AI can be very complex. And it's like, you know, if it just makes a wrong decision, what's the impact of that? And so we've been thinking about maintenance and is maintenance coordination going to go away? All that sort of stuff. You know, we're just starting to tap into the world that is understanding the data of the real world and creating a digital twin to some extent, which is basically we have data that properly reflects what's happening in the real world. And then once you do that, you can start to understand what are those interesting correlations that what levers people can move to ultimately make an outcome that they want. And then you can get to this point where I think the idea is um, the distance between even where we're at at property mill, which I think we're we're the ones who've got probably the biggest head start in this. The difference between that and ultimately making a decision if a resident submits a maintenance request and like if a leaky toilet, the ability to understand if it's water leaking on the ground or it's leaking in the tank and those implications and it automatically runs everything, schedules everything, we're so far out. But where it feasibly can get in the more short term in terms of maintenance is what, what's called like, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, is AI like assisted decision making where it's like, you're not making the decision, much like Wolfgang is talking about, you input something, you get an output, you're accepting the decision, you're control C, control being somewhere. But like the cost of getting wrong on that is, you know, you say in regards or whatever at the top of the email, it's very light, the risk is light. But when it starts to become, when it's maintenance and it's somebody's home and it's potential $20,000 and there's potential litigation involved, and all that sort of stuff, this becomes really important. So the concept of where data can go, once you get clean data and you can essentially train outcomes and all this, you can do what's called AI-assisted decision-making, which is basically when that request comes in, maybe it's suggesting a next step, but a human being's backing it up to where it's not like, you still need a maintenance coordinator that knows what a toilet is and knows what, you know, all that's happening. But when it says, hey, do you wanna send somebody out as an emergency repair or somebody not? We're going to suggest this because of the information and the AI is suggesting it, but it's not actually making that decision. And I will tell you, even from that element, I think it's going to take years to get it very robust to where it is injected in every aspect of the maintenance process. Um, just as a context from what we're seeing on data and just kind of what we're seeing in the industry. So, Ray, do you, I mean, do you think it will get to the point where the AI will say, okay, your properties are located in Northern California. And based on our data set, we recommend that these properties in this area get this maintenance done based on our data, that you'll make those recommendations or predictions. Yeah, and I think Tom really kind of set it out earlier, the difference between AI and machine learning, like the ability to take large data sets, like you know, property mail captures what's happening in terms of repair, when it's scheduled, how happy the resident is, the cost, when it happened, what location. And so you can start to do some of those things. And if you're using some of our Property Care Plus preventative programs, it can start mapping out who's doing what kinds of programs and what's the impact it's ultimately having on the maintenance cost of the unit or the frequency of repairs. So I absolutely think what you're talking about, Wolfgang, is being able to make suggested recommendations for preventative programs and some of the other things. And sort of that machine learning is very real. Um, but I think having somebody replace and, and make the decision for is the, I think that's the big difference in such a, a leap away from where we're at currently, just, just from gonna, a data aspect. Right, I was just gonna jump in, just, uh, you said recommendations. I was just gonna add a little bit more technical layers, like what you're referring to, right, is a recommendation system, right? So we're all familiar with Netflix and, and Amazon and collaborative filtering, but this is where you take recommendation systems to the next level. It's sort of like advanced topic and deep learning where, you know, you, you just don't use it for like shopping, for example, and getting, you know, presented the next best thing. This is where you can practical application recommendation systems in real world operational operational contexts, like, uh, like Ray was mentioning. And uh, if you want to do more research and look it up, recognition systems, and obviously you might get in the weeds as far as technical aspects of it, but in the non-technical, this is where this is where we're going to go. And assisted decision making is going to be leveraging heavily 
the uh, evolution's recommendation system. So keep, that's going to be on the on the horizon and in the forefront, and along with natural language processing and and like GPT GPT three by OpenAI. So before we um, move to something different here, I just want to open it up. Like I feel like we've heard a couple things of hey. It, it, people have been hearing about AI and specifically AI in real estate and specifically in rental real estate and property management for you know a, a long time. I think there's a number of people who feel like there've been some like broken promises. And I, I think about like it, looking back on it with what you've shared now, I think about vendors who are getting started and saying like, we're bringing AI to this, but they have no customers and they have no data set, right? And so like how much value can you drive without that sizable data set is I feel like an important insight, you know, that was, was shared here and will continue to be a challenge and a barrier, you know, for folks moving forward, right? I like what you said about, um, you know, hey, considering the risk, you know, the small tail, you know, risk and impact of that. And where's the ticky tack maintenance of uh, resetting a GFI outlet or, you know, resetting a disposal or some of these things that are, quality of life. It's not that they're unimportant, um, you know, but, you know, they, they don't have the gravity of making the wrong predictive decision of like changing out an HVAC unit on, <laughs> you know, how that's going to impact residents or investors or other folks about helping property managers on this call think about what's going to be fast to move in this direction, what's going to be slow to move in this direction. What am I looking for and paying attention so that I understand, you know, my strategy and the kind of decisions I'm making I feel confident as a business owner. I feel like we've given some good context in addition to uh, to practical applications here. Um, wh where I want to go next, and, and feel if there's anything else you guys want to cover on that, feel free to just ignore anything I'm saying and talk about whatever you want, right? That's we're, we're here, here for You this, said bacon. We got to bring in bacon. So there we, we go. We got to make our way to bacon at some point here. Um, you know, the, the question and curiosity that I'm talking to a couple of folks before you know, this event and what they'd want to, you know, learn about and think about. I, I think a core question for this audience is, what's your opinion? And we'll, we'll call it that. It's an opinion. What's your opinion on, is this good for professional property managers like the ones who are on this call, right? Is what's happening going to be good for a self-managing landlord? We talk about this gap between the professional and the accidental landlord, right? Is this, are there forces at play here that shrink this gap? Are there opportunities that actually expand this gap? Is the answer both, right? And dependent on something else. I'd love to just, you know, hear, hear your guys' opinion on that. Wolf, I'd like to start with you if you don't mind and uh, would love to get, get a take from each of you. So I always, um, I think it's being in property management, you always think the worst of people because everybody's a liar that walks through the front door till they prove innocent. So for me, the the self-managing and the, the smaller, I think the biggest fear is it goes back to the data set, right? He who controls the data rules the world. So when you have these large national trade organizations for the real estate industry that sell out to private companies, um, they have the control of the data set, right? You know, the MLS, the, all these different things, that is the data set. So if they then sell their data to companies that then can create great AI and now make it available to everybody, it really reduces what I can offer to differentiate myself. And it's going to come down to, which is, you know, what Second Nature is known for, that that customer, that client experience. So sure, the AI is going to get better. It's going to allow the the DIY landlord to do more on their own. I remember, you know, like 15 years ago, a differentiator was, well, we can run your tenant's credit. Now anybody can run a tenant's credit. That's no big deal. So those tech things, those tools or those things that you thought were so great, it's going to come down to one thing. How do you make people feel and those that may feel good are going to write you checks. If you don't make them feel good, you're not going to get a check. The the tech tools you have are, you know, everybody's going to have access to them. But my my fear is some of these national associations are going to sell their data set because that's their most valuable asset. And especially with some of the um, um, anti-competition or the, you know, competition laws out there, the the selling of that data is going to really make it harder for smaller companies to just be average you're gonna to have to be great if you want to stay in business 
I think one of the things that I, I have to imagine um, now, I wasn't there, um, but but when the calculator first came out, I have to imagine it was considered cheating by a lot of people. And it was like, but but why you haven't used the whatever the thing with the wooden dowels and you move the abacus and you're or abacus. Plus, thank you. And everybody was sitting there going, this is witchcraft. And, you know, just abacus is you, you learn the foundational elements of what we're doing. And that's what makes you exceptional. There's value in still understanding fundamental math. But I think the the thing that AI is doing much like this is the value chains moving, just like the calculator. It's like, and, you know, I saw some comments and some notes about people being able to write papers. Maybe the value chain of human beings is not about writing papers anymore. And that's not the value that you're doing. And so I think if we consider in that concept, is it good or is it good for the industry is probably a better question asked, will it go there regardless? And the idea in thinking through real estate, I can really move down to two different things. Predictable NOI, and you hang on to your residence. Like, those are probably it. And so then you can go back and go, can AI help me improve those two things? And if it can, boy, is it going to happen? If it can't, it probably won't unless the reward function of real estate changes somehow. And so I think AI in property management is probably going to find its ways in what Wolfgang was talking about, which is what sort of things that you normally hire a Fiverr or you got a virtual assistant somewhere or anything like that. Um, I think more complexly making a decision about how to do a repair or whether to repair or replace or some of these other things or make other decisions, there's value in there. But it's, are any of these tools going to be really beneficial by AI or machine learning that are going to address, adjust those two metrics? And if they do, I would say it's not, is it good for the industry? It's just, how do I need to get involved with this? Because ultimately my investors care about that. Throw in something here, it's more like philosophizing about, you know, what's happening with AI, of what you guys have been mentioning. It's the commoditization of technology, right? It's the democratization of, of technology, putting the hands of many. And this has been an age old problem with technology and what forces, it forces competitions, forces, it actually uh, liberates uh, a lot of companies to do what they do best, just taking care of their customers, right? And uh, and if so, it's going to force competition, force you to, to do what you do best, and what your what your competitive advantage is is, is your core mission. And the you know, democratization of technology in other people's hands is, is going to be an inevitable fact. And like Chat GPT, would if you think about it, well, it's going to put all the content writers out of business, right? But is it? Is it? You know, like. Um, so this is where it's going to force in that particular uh, industry some real reevaluation of uh, of what what your differentiation is. So that's just an example of what Ch Chat GPT could do, but um, and but all these different examples that you're mentioning is just going to force all the co the companies to, to to be more competitive and and also like I said alleviate and liberate them to do what they do best. So can, can yeah. I say one other thing on there? And I'm sorry for just jumping in here. Yeah. You know, I was doing this talk at our user summit, and the thing is, is talking about the value chain moving. And if you look at the cars of like the 70s, there was a built in light to basically work on your vehicle. That was the value, right? They were adding value there. And then eventually it like moved on to where you had a reliable vehicle. And that was like the Honda. And then the value chain moves to where it's like, you know, you've uh, it's safe. And then the value chain moves and it's driving itself. Like you tend to commoditize. Nobody tends to win like all in alone and commoditize it. Like Tom said, it forces you to move. So I think for us, making sure we're not putting all of our eggs in the basket of saying we're just really good at reading a prospective residence application. That's probably not a very defensible place where you're ultimately going to have a lot of value. And so continuing to move down the value chain of putting more emphasis. I'm a big one on maintenance. I'm a little biased, but it's got to be one of those other things that are harder to do that these are going to take off and potentially become pretty even in the industry and keep, keep moving because I think that's ultimately the long term defensibility and it does free it up. But I think hanging on to that personal touch is a great one that I've talked to a lot of people about. You can hang on to it, but if it's not where the value is for people and you're hanging on to it, it's going to be a problem. And I'm not saying personal touch is not it. That's not my point. Some people really want to have a phone call to talk to somebody that exists for certain places, not 100% calls, but anyways. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think gr uh, great points. Of, and I feel like there's definitely been a theme if people have listened to a lot of different podcast episodes or part of events or just a, a thread through a lot of the conversation in this industry is 
occasionally checking in and thinking about what's being commoditized or what's being more easily duplicated, right, in property management, right? And what are the unique strengths, skills, capabilities that I can create in my company, right, that are going to be durable and valuable? Not just that people like, right, but that people are also willing to pay for, you know, I would take to, to raise last point, uh, you know, okay, I like it, but am I also willing to pay for it? Is this something that, you know, I can build a, a business on? And so creating those experiences, people may want different experiences and there's opportunities to segment on different customers, but uh, it's interesting to think about, you know, what's going to happen to the rate of change in certain areas as it relates to commoditization and the barrier. Um, and just thinking about in the workforce at large, you know, attendance-based compensation. Like when I think about roles like, um, you know, the bellhop or whatever it might be, or and maybe that's not even the best example, right? Somebody who's there to stand and greet or whatever it might be, or, you know, whatever it might be. Okay, well, if the goal is just to be there to pull a lever, <laughs> you know, or to, to sit there at a parking lot attendant, right? Those are, those are the kind of jobs, like a parking lot attendant, that gets replaced right, by technology um, you know, more quickly than other jobs where making a difference is more scarce. Right? And how, how do we create that kind of value? Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that happens in real estate here. So, I think it's, cool. it's also like, how do, we use, how do we use this tech? I'm seeing some comments you know, from people that are concerned, like I'm barely holding on to you know, what I'm learning now. And uh, one of the things that we tried to when I was a middle school teacher, tried to teach the kids that the the skills of the 22nd century is the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn as quickly as possible. Because that's, you know, you, something that you learned five years ago is probably not going to be as useful, you know, now. It, it's being able to learn, unlearn, and relearn the new is the skill that you need to have. And so it's how can I use these tools, whether it's AI, machine learning, Zapier, Lead Simple property mail, whatever it may be, how do I use those so that I can free up time so that I can focus on those those items that have moved with the value chain, as Ray was saying. So like one example for us, you know, we looked at, you know, what are what are things that we can have the computer do and then what are we going to do with that free time? So one thing that we've built into our what we call our weekly process is because we've been able to have the computer do more is we now have a property manager and our client success coordinator, they each, so the property manager does owners, client success coordinator on tenants, they call one a day just to say, hey, what's up? They now have that time to do that because we've been able to have the computer do other things. And because if the only relation, if the relationship you have with your owners is only around something's broken and I need money, it's not going to be a very healthy relationship, right? They're like, oh my gosh, they're they're calling again. Something must be broken, or they need a check. But to now change it, where your property manager is called, hey, how's it going? You know, they can look at the notes to see how the, the past conversation went, and just to check in and see how life is going. We've been able to get new listings from that, new sales, lots of different things because now we have more time to focus on higher value tasks because now we've unloaded things to the computer. For example, I brought up the property descriptions. We went around our office and we figured that people were spending between 30 and 45 minutes to write what they felt was a really good property description. We've now saved that time, right? Because what the computer spits out, it's good enough and sometimes it's better, right? So I think it's how do we use these tools, not so much to have bells and whistles, but to create time that we can use in what we feel are, are higher value ways. Um, one of the things that I think just kind of as a delineation, AI is a how. I think identifying what, what you're going to move is really important. So I released a LinkedIn post about what we're calling our ladder of maintenance. It's kind of a play on Maslow's ladder of hierarchy of needs, but it's maintenance. And so the idea behind it is I think starting out with saying, what is the metric in your business you need to move the most is still the most prudent conversation, not how do I inject AI into my business? And if you're sitting there saying, I wanna move this particular metric or this particular number, like how can I do that? Now, AI, now, if your metric to move is the amount of time you spend on mundane tasks, like that's a great one. Wolfgang gave some great examples of that. Then you can sit there and say, AI makes a lot of sense here. 
But I still think we're at a point where businesses getting more crystal clear on their KPIs, what metrics they want to move. The how and the AI being able to move that still a little ways off in my uh, humble opinion. And so I stay, I th still think that that's the direction of the decision-making of how to inject AI is really still starting with the what, um, what you're going to move. That's awesome. great. Well, guys, here's what I want to do just with timing that we've got left. Um, call, it, call it like a parting shot here, or if there's um, you know, anything you feel like, man, it, was, it wasn't said and I've got 30 seconds, you know, here's some tactical, practical value I want to end with, or just a thought you know, to leave people with um, you know, before we have a couple exciting announcements to make. And, uh, and we'll ask even the audience to reflect back some of their top takeaways in the chat here is some good feedback uh, as well. But why don't we do this? Um, you know, can we go, let's do this. Let's do Tom, Tom, Ray, and Wolf. Would you guys yeah. mind quick parting shot? No, sure. I was just going to jump in and, and, you know, talk about what Ray just said. I feel like I've been doing that the entire time, but this is an important thing to note is that, um, as I said before, you know, the application and figuring out what you're going to do with it is, is one of the aspects, but obviously uh, what the good, the really good thing about ChatGPT besides it writing content for you and being an endless source of entertainment, right? It's starting to actually bring AI to the forefront and create this momentum that wasn't totally there before. And as, as Ray said, it, the AI in its, in, in its current state isn't totally accessible by everybody. The nice thing about Chat, chat GPT, it's accessible. You can go there, you can start playing with it, the end. If there's no math involved, there's nothing. So other parts of AI, there is, right? Um, and we're not totally there for it to be completely consumable by, by, uh, by the, the, the population. But with things like GPT, momentum is going to start pushing. And you're going to, you're going to start seeing is this stuff being commoditized, productized, to be consumable by the person who doesn't need, you don't need an engineer, you don't need a data scientist, you don't need to know statistics, but you do need to know your KPIs and you, you want to know where to get to in your business, but you have no idea how to use AI. V very soon in the next two years, you will see that those, 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 those uh, products merging and enabling us to do that. So I'm very excited about that. So that's my parting shot. Well said, Tom. Mm -hmm. I think there's kind of uh, there's kind of stages that this is ultimately going to go. So I think the first thing is we have to have data collection, like real world data collection. And once you have data, you can start doing measurements. And then once you have measurements, you can start implementing automation to figure out what's moving the metric. And then we're going to move to op optimization. And then we're going to move to elimination. And so I just wrote that down. It's probably really stupid, but um, but the idea is I think we're still in data and measurement as an industry. And I think it'd probably be a little obtuse to say, we're gonna to go to elimination out the gate. We're still learning. Property Melt has 450,000 rental units on our platform. We process around $550 million in invoices annually. We're still getting the measurements and the data to be able to even start thinking about these things. And so the idea of jumping to the end, I think we're still a little ways off. I think for me, um, I've used this image a couple times, but the rumba that's spreading the dog crap all over the house, it, it, don't worry about the AI and the zaps and all the those sexy bells and whistles. It's policies and procedures in your processes that, you know, if you don't have rock solid policies that are then put in action with your processes, all AI is going to do is screw it up even more and frustrate people. So um, really you know, going back to the KPIs and all those other, it's get your policies nailed down on all your situations. And how, how do you do things? What's our policy on waiving a late rent fee? What's our policy on adding, removing a roommate? Like nail that down first, because if you don't have that, it doesn't matter what GPT or super neutron you have or whatever, it, it's not going to matter. And then from there, Roll up your sleeves, do the dirty work, and make your processes. You you cannot outsource that. That is your business. Your business isn't your lead simple template. Your business isn't your your zap or your your cool graphic you have on your website. Your business is your processes. Without that, you have nothing. So nail those down. Once you have that, then start looking at you know these these other items. But um, to stay on top of what I learn about. AI or all this for the us common folk down here. Um, Zapier has a great email newsletter that isn't just a sales page. They're sharing all kinds of different things. I highly recommend you subscribe to that and start looking for people on Twitter. There's a, a wealth of knowledge that people are sharing and then LinkedIn. Uh, those would be the three areas that, you know, I, you find people that 
seem smart, follow them, and then, you know, start going from there. But uh, the the knowledge that you need as a property manager is not going to come from a keynote. It's going to come from your peers in sessions like this where where people are talking. But if you're if you're feeling a little anxiety right now by, oh, my gosh, one more thing I got to figure out. Look back. Do you have your policies and your processes nailed down? If not, start there. I can tell you personally that when you don't have those, things get screwed up. So focus there first and then start looking at, and sometimes you have to do it simultaneously. You have to dual track it, but then look at the tech and the the, the AI and all those other things that you can start bringing in. But um, the, the reality is that you need to be able to learn, unlearn and relearn at the speed of the internet to stay successful. Awesome. Guys, some, some great stuff there. I did promise people there was going to be something we had to announce at the end today. Um, you know, we'd love to, before you, before you all leave, feel free to drop in the chat what you're taking away. I heard a lot of interesting things that might shift how you're thinking or your perspective today. I heard a lot of interesting things about practical applications to be put into place and things that maybe you were considering rushing into that maybe you're, you're now feeling better about you know, putting off and knowing what to look for. Um, lots of great stuff here. Really appreciate the panel. I just want to express my gratitude and thanks to all three of you uh, for being here today and generously giving up your time uh, and your expertise here. And, uh, and the announcement that I promised to folks is uh, we are in previous years, we've had TWLX. If you've attended TWLX, you know, it's really like the premier online digital event for professional property managers. And we do things a little differently. It's not just like YouTube video after YouTube video. Uh, sitting through it, we we get you actually unlike this, you know, really into small group, you know, interaction with your peers to talk about okay, you know, how might we actually get some momentum in putting this in place? So while we weren't prepared to facilitate that today, um, we've got TWX coming, and we're actually based on feedback going to have a broker owner only option. It's going to be May sixteenth. We are going to have an option later in the year where the entire team can come as well. Um, but we just heard so much from people on Broker Owner Day of the two-day event, how being able to have conversation you know, with their peers at that level um, was great, as it was great also talking with people from diverse parts of an organization for different kinds of conversations. So uh, really excited. May 16th, that's going to be happening. This will be a fundraiser, 100% of proceeds going to NARPUM's charity, uh, Communities in Schools, I think is the name of the charity, if I remember it correctly. Uh, I just, we're, we're so excited to be a part uh, and grateful to be a part of this amazing property management community and share it with you. Uh, it's really cool how this community coming together, learning together, growing together can also make a great impact you know, in your local communities on people, people who need it. So our goal is to raise uh, some five figure amount. So just know every dollar in a ticket, you know, above, above costs is, is going to that. Uh, we're really excited to announce keynote speakers, great panels like this one, you know, will be a part of that great interaction, collaboration, conversation with peers is a part of that. Uh, you, you won't regret it. There's going to be a link down in the chat as that opens up today and more information to come. Encourage you to sign up, uh, sign up today. So with that, we're right on time. Laura Mack, I think we have one more bonus free event, the Modern Property Managers yeah. Tech Stack, which is coming next month. Uh, we've already got one or two panelists for that. We are looking for one or two other panelists. So if you're here, my guess is you're probably interested in property management technology. Maybe you have some expertise there you'd like to offer from the Zoom stage, similar to how we did today. Feel free to just uh, e email Laura Mack about that or let us know in whatever way Laura's saying to let you know, uh, let us know in the chat. And we've got a bonus free event for everybody as well next month. Uh, thanks again to all of our panelists. Seen a lot of appreciation in the chat. With that, happy Tuesday. Keep stacking your triple wins and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. That's all for today's Triple Win Property Management Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for sharing a piece of your life with us. We do not take it for granted. I also want to give a shout out to Carol Housel for everything she and our team does to make these possible. It's crazy to think about over 5,000 professional property managers have pressed play on episodes in season one and season two now. And we really wanna encourage you to keep giving feedback because more and more people are listening. It's getting better and better and better. 
thanks to everything that you're sharing with us. If you like this enough to listen, I want to encourage you to share it with other people. Um, you can give us feedback directly on those social media channels, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you're hanging out. You can also send us an email at triplewin at secondnature.com. And we just want to give more. We're, we're, there's no sales pitch here. Just want to offer more resources that help you find and stack your next triple win and become a triple win driven property manager. So where can you find that? You can find the private Facebook group. You can find our blog. You can find our newsletter. You can find more resources all at rbp.secondnature.com. Com. Just search for what you're looking for there. And every time we see you, we want to see a better version of you and your business. To that end, keep it going, feel inspired, take our encouragement, and we'll see you next time.